Welcome back, everybody. I know it's been a while since I've posted a video, but I'm back. I want to keep going strong. Sometimes life happens, sometimes work happens, and we can't get to the things that we enjoy, like making these videos. But now, you know, my schedule's cleared up considerably, and I'm able to get back to making a few of these videos every week. So as always, if there's anything you do want to see a video on, make sure to leave them in the comments section. I've been doing pretty good about answering most every single comment that's been left, and a lot of them I've actually turned into video ideas, so make sure to leave those down below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, help out the YouTube algorithm, subscribe, let's keep growing the channel. And with that, let's get into today's video, which is going to be not that long of a video, but I think it's something that's really important nonetheless. And that's the what I consider to be a good way of reading scientific literature. And the reason I consider it that way is because it, one, is I think the faster way to screen papers, which is arguably the most time consuming thing, right? Is actually like deciding what to read and what's worth your time to read. You probably spend more time screening papers than you actually do reading papers. And the other thing is the way that you can critically think while you're reading it to assess what it is that you're reading, okay? So this is something that's maybe geared towards a more junior person, individual that's maybe in grad school, you know, whether they're just starting or whether they've been in there for a few years. Hopefully as you transition into a postdoc, you start, you know, developing these skills because this is something that just takes time, years and years of practice before you could get really good at it. It's just like anything else, but I think anyone can do this. So, you know, before we get into like what actually I do, I want to talk about how I used to want to read literature. And that was to look through an abstract to get an idea of what it was that I was reading, read an intro, methods, results, discussion. That used to be exactly the way that I would want to do it, okay? Now the way that I normally do it is I read title, part of abstract, and then from there I pretty much make a decision. Should I be adding this to my queue of papers that I want to read, or is this something that I should pass on? Then what I want to read is the intro slash results, discussion, and methods. And I'll put an asterisk next to methods because I typically don't even read the methods unless this is something that I'm like, I have no idea what they did here and I want to learn more about it. And we'll kind of talk about, you know, this newer way of how I read papers. But I think that for most of us, when we first start, this, what I'm highlighting here, is the way that we would want to read papers, right? You would want to read the abstract. You'd want to read the introduction. Okay, like, what is the relevant literature? What is the, you know, overarching idea? And then methods. The reason that I put this towards the end now is that in general, when I'm reading papers, I am reading something that I am extremely familiar with all the methodology in that field. There may be something here or there that I'm not quite sure what they did, but in general, you know, it, the cell-based experiments, the in vivo-based experiments, the omics-type experiments, I know exactly what it is that they're doing. I don't need to spend the time reading the method section um, unless I either don't know the method that they're using, it's something new that I've never seen, or it's something where I'm looking at the results and I say the data that they have just don't really add up. Like there's something missing. They must have changed something in their methodology. And then I could go back and look and say, oh yeah, they only injected the animal with blank dose, which is you know half of what they normally use. That's why the results look a little weird. Um, but when you're first starting, you're gonna to wanna to read the method section first, right? You, you, you're not familiar with these methods. And in fact, you spend more time trying to figure out what the methods are than anything else, just trying to learn what it is that they actually did. And then you'd get into the results and then you're gonna spend a considerable amount of time on the discussion trying to figure out what it is that they said. So what I did is I pulled up an article that I am reading right now, or I'm about to start reading, I should say. I've, you know, maybe read a couple uh, sentences in the introduction, but 
This is one that I found in, in the journal Science Translational Medicine, which is an excellent, excellent journal. High impact factor, really great quality work that comes out of here. If you're not familiar with this journal, I suggest taking a look. Um, and I kind of want to walk through an example of what it is that I personally would do thinking about all of the things that we just talked about and how I would screen a paper like this, how I would read it, digest it, and kind of what I would be looking to get out of it and how I would critically think about it. So the first thing is, you know, where do you find these articles to begin with? So sometimes when you're first starting out, what you need is your PI to start sending you, you know, manuscripts because you don't know where to find them. But over time, what you could do is start doing things like setting PubMed alerts for specific authors that you think are worth looking at. I have email alerts for table of contents for journals that I really enjoy. Um, so I really like science translational medicine, the nature series from like nature cell biology, nature reviews. Um, I get from cell. There's, you know, it depends on what you're interested in. So, you know, if you're into endocrinology, maybe you want to get an endocrinology, you know, table of contents sent for, to you from the journal endocrinology. Um, you know, it all depends. And what I did was as I was I was reading through the table of contents, this one caught my eye. The title is Antisense Oligonucleotide Therapy in a Humanized Mouse Model of MECP2 Duplication Syndrome. And the reason it caught my eye is because I am currently doing some work with ASOs, antisense oligonucleotides. And, you know, I kind of want to see what they were talking about. And so what I did was I read the first few paragraphs Many intellectual disability disorders are due to copy number variants, and to date, there have been no treatment options tested for these classes of disease. You know, this MECP2 duplication syndrome, MDS, is one of the most common. Um, you know, this is what it does. We've previously shown that asocery can reduce this in a mouse model. However, this only carried one transgenic human allele and one mouse allele, you know, so they want to basically change what they're doing. They're looking to make a humanized mouse model. Um, okay, you know, so far I'm interested. It seems like something I'm, I'm interested in. So I downloaded the paper. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is actually go through the introduction and I'm going to see what they actually talk about. And is this something that to me is two things. One, is it relevant to what I want to do? And two, do I feel like they actually address an interesting question that I think that they can experimentally test? Okay, so if you go through this introduction, what you're going to find is actually something really interesting. Okay, so there is this MECP2, which is some sort of an epigenetic regulator. What it does isn't important. It's an epigenetic regulator. But what is important to know is that if you completely lose function of this, you will develop Rett syndrome, okay? And if you have too much of it, you will get this MDS. And so what they would like to do is they would like to use an ASO, an antisense oligonucleotide, to knock down expression of this MECP2 so they can protect from MDS. However, they cannot knock it down too much because if they do, you will develop Rett syndrome, this RTT. So there's this really fine, delicate balance here, right? They want to knock down this gene so they can protect against one disease, but if they knock it down too much, you could develop a different disease. That's a really interesting question to me, and I really want to know more about it. I also want to learn how they made their humanized mouse models. These are things that happen all the time. A humanized mouse model is just a mouse model that expresses some type of human cell or allele, um, you know, depending on the, the, the terminology that people use. Um, so yeah, this is something that totally catches my attention. So now that my attention is caught and I would like to actually continue reading now that I have gone through the introduction, what will I do next? Well, I actually am going to skip the results. I'm going to jump all the way down to wherever the discussion starts. And there is a 
specific reason for that. Okay. All scientific literature is written the exact same, and it's super formulaic. And once you know what the formula is, you know where to look for what they're writing, okay? So the discussion is always going to be some kind of variant of this. Using a humanized mouse model of MDS, this study highlights the feasibility of titrating ASOs to decrease MECP2 expression. We found that the expression, blah, 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 blah. This is what we found, blah, 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 blah. This is all what they found, all right? And so the reason that I come down here and I read the first one sentence to one paragraph of the discussion is because pretty much every single paper is going to restate what they think is the most important point and what their couple most important conclusions are. And then they're going to go through the rest of their discussion and they're going to start framing it within the broader context. They're going to start trickling in other you know, pieces of information that they found in their article or that they wrote about in their article. But that first sentence especially and then through the first paragraph, that's where they're going to summarize the big juicy stuff of their paper and I want to know so here what they're saying using a humanized mouse model of MDS this study highlights the feasibility of titrating ASOs to decrease MECP2 expression okay so I want to be convinced convince me that you have a humanized mouse model of MDS that's the first thing do they actually establish a proper model of MDS yes or no and if they do, can they, in fact, demonstrate that they could titrate this ASO to de decrease MECT, MECP2 expression, yes or no, okay? And bonus points, remember I said that if you decrease it too much, that yes, you will protect from MDS, but you would develop RTT. Do they actually demonstrate that? That's like the bonus points if they could do that. We found that expression of this is down-regulated. Okay, so it, it goes on and what I would do is I would kind of get in my mind, what are the key points? What are the things that I wanna look at and say, critically, yes, you convinced me, okay? So then what you would do is you would come back up here and you would kind of reread the introduction just to familiarize yourself and then you would start going through the results section, okay? So the first thing they do is they gener generate and characterize this humanized mouse model. That's the first figure. So that's what's happening in this figure. I better be convinced when I read that you know, paragraph associated with this figure and look at the data that that is what they've in fact done. So what do they show in this figure? They show the breeding scheme, the MECP2 mRNA expression, protein, you know, confocal microscopy, and then what is this? This is just looking at memory, right? Open arms, elevated plus maze, distance, open field, rotor rod. I'm guessing that this is coordination and this is some kind of memory that they're looking at, all right? And then I would keep going, right? Figure two, widespread distribution of ASO, MEC, knockdown, blah, 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 blah. You get the picture. It's rinse and repeat. You're going through each figure and you're saying, convince me. I want to be convinced. If I can poke holes in what it is that you're saying you're you're showing me, it's not a good paper. And in general, when you get to these higher level journals, that doesn't happen. Although I will say, just because a paper is published in Nature does not mean it's a good paper. There is a lot of junk that gets published in Nature for one reason or another. And so you need to just be careful and make sure that you really read through and that you're really convinced. Then what you do is you come down to the discussion. Again, putting on your critical thinking cap. Did they convince me of everything? And as they start framing the broader context of what they talked about, do they actually you know, advance the field in some sort of a meaningful way? Okay. And then once you're done, you're done. And you could go through the study design then later, but I tend to use that more as a supplement just to make sure that I know what I'm you know, reading or if there's any specific kinds of questions that I have. 
And yeah, that's about it. So I think we're going to wrap it up then. I hope that this was useful, especially to some more junior members that are trying to figure out what, what is maybe a good way to read a manuscript. There's no one right way, but this is what works for me and what I've seen works well for other people. So with that, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye.